Welcome back to the Roundtable. I'm Audrey Vox, and today we're joined with a special guest, John from Nerdist. Hey, y'all. I'm John. I'm also known as Johnny Two Cellos on my YouTube channel. Thanks so much for having me, man. I'm excited to talk about this show. Today, we're here to talk about She-Ra, and it's great to have you on. We'll be discussing the first three episodes. Uh, we both have watched the entire season, but uh, this is kind of just like a first impressions, uh, just discussion around the first three episodes, just because not everyone has probably had the time to watch the entire season yet. What is your, like, your general, like, first, like, impression, like, your takeaway from these episodes and the show as a whole? Uh, I think what I love most about it is that they sort of brought the characters and their relationships to the forefront of the show. I watched a little bit of the old show after watching this one, and while it has, like, a really cool world and setting and lore, the characters and relationships were kind of secondary to the, the plots, and I really like that they centered everything around Adora and her relationship with Catra, as well as the princesses and Bo. So I think that makes this a really strong show, and and I, I really like the way that those relationships developed. I completely agree. I really adore how character-driven the show is. It's one of those shows where the characters drive the plot, and especially with Adora and Catra, and you especially see that here in these first three episodes, but like the plot is pretty much driven by the relationship. Like Either the plot impacts it, or they impact the plot, and I feel like that's something that not necessarily missing, but hasn't been perfected in modern cartoons. Just like, there's always character development, but it feels kind of disjointed from the story. Where here, it's like everything has consequence to it. It feels like Adora and Catra are kind of on these parallel journeys. So like their relationship is important, but they're both kind of rising up in the ranks of these separate rival different groups, you know, the Rebellion and the Horde. And I think it's really interesting to see how their journeys parallel each other. Because I feel like the first thing the show really does is establish how different Catra is from Ursula Horde. Because we have the opening of Adora and the rest of the Horde training. And Catra is, like, she kind of lets everyone do the hard work for her. She makes a fashionably late entrance. She's a lot more aware than the other Horde members. Like, she even says in episode two that, like, it's pretty obvious the Horde is, like, manipulating them. Like, that's their whole tactic. But goes along with it, where I feel as if everyone else would have the exact same reaction that Adora did, where they'd be kind of taken aback. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's really interesting. And probably one of the reasons that she's able to rise in the ranks of the Horde so well is because she's not just necessarily falling in line with the rest of them. She's actually thinking for herself, even though she's still not willing to leave the Horde, she's still kind of working within it. I feel like each character has their own different dynamic. Like, Bo and Glimmer, they kind of remind me, like, of a, I want to say, like, a platonic sibling relationship, where characters as, um, I don't believe they're in the, these uh, first three episodes, but where Mista and Seahawk is obviously, like, more, like, couple-y uh, pairing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, they kind of have a, a fun, kind of contentious couple relationship, but Bo and Glimmer definitely seem like best friends, and I also love that uh, even though they're best friends, they're they're not always in agreement, and sometimes throughout the season, a little bit at odds. Yeah, I feel like that was at least something that was refreshing to see. Like, they're clearly, like, best friends. Like, I think Glimmer even remarks to, like, Bo is really, like, her only friend until Dora comes along. It feels like an organic friendship. Like, they do argue. They don't always see eye to eye, but you can tell they both really care for each other. Yeah, agreed. Um, and I really liked within these first couple episodes how, even though they're on the same side, you really see a difference in their personality, especially once they meet Adora. You kind of see that, that Glimmer is a little bit more stubborn and still not trusting Adora right Away, but I feel like Bo, Bo seemed to trust Adora before Adora even realized the Horde was bad, which which was, I think, a really great character building moment for him. And you'll see this later on in the season about getting spoilers, but when he interacts with a different member from the Horde, like, he's very much, uh, ask questions first, <laughs> as opposed <laughs> yeah. to, uh, like, strike first and then ask questions later. You can get the sense that he's very kind, and when it's time to get into action, he definitely does so, but you can tell that he prefers pacifism over anything else. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think also later in the season, they show that that kind of makes him a good leader. Like he's he's very inspiring and he kind of helps, he helps inspire more regular folks to uh, rise up to certain occasions. And moving away from Bo, I was also thinking about um, Shadow Weaver. Yeah, she's awesome. That performance from, I think her name is Lorraine Toussaint. She is amazing. Yeah, when she was like initially introduced, I wasn't like really vibing with her, but like she quickly like becomes like an interesting character. Like her first scene, it's kind of like, all right, like generic bad guy, but it evolves into something a lot more complex, especially when you realize like this is just, she's kind of both this maternal figure, yet authoritative power over Adora and Catra. If anything, I feel like she's more of a main villain despite her 
Hordak being the one in control of the Horde, it feels like the show is like really focusing on Shadow Weaver and how she impacts Adora and Catra. And you can see like how her grasp over her, like her, like just like the mental manipulation and abuse over the years still has a grasp on them and like how they conduct themselves in every day and like how their goals are pretty much a consequence of how uh, she raised them and like their upbringing with her. Yeah, totally. The way she sort of played favorites with Adora kind of ended up determining Adora's entire outlook and personality. And it also determined uh, how Catra went about her life within the horde and like how she sort of, I mean, this is kind of later in the season with, with how she to overtake uh, Adora in terms of her place in the horde. But I really enjoyed that backstory between them was it did a really good job informing how Catra and Adora kind of carry themselves within the rebellion in the horde. Yeah. And in relation to Shadow Weaver's role and like how this maternal figure kind of molded Catra and Adora, there's also Glimmer and her mother and uh, like Glimmer's first scene with her mother, like the tradition we get to Glimmer pretty much establishes that like she's trying to prove herself and that's her consistent character arc throughout the season. That's an interesting dynamic because not only is she sort of her commander but she's her mother so <laughs> they have this funny dynamic where like she she's trying to be a good commander but then she gets punished as a daughter for her actions that she takes uh, as a military leader which is definitely maybe not the best dynamic for, for a rebellion but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah it definitely feels as if her mother can't separate the commander from the mother part. Yeah, and I think we find out why later in the season, which is a good moment towards the end. Yeah, I feel like everything is done with a purpose here, like how every character interaction, every plot point, everything's they pretty much lay the groundwork flawlessly. I feel as if with other shows, it takes a while to get to that point, to get to that payoff, but something else I noticed with Shira just in these first three or so episodes is that th they are pretty much like quick to the point. They don't like really like holding qu like lingering questions over our heads, which I think is also a good change of pace. Yeah, I agree. I, sometimes when they sometimes when they leave a question lingering, it can it can distract from what's going on. So I agree. I think that helps pace it up pretty well. So with the uh, first episode, uh, part one of the sword, Adora is sent on this mission. Uh, do, you, do you remember what the mission was? Well, when she went to the Whispering Woods, it was she actually just stole a skiff with Catra after she told Catra she was going to get promoted to Forest Captain and Catra couldn't go with. They steal the skiff just to go check out out what's outside the Fright Zone, and that's like them leaving the Fright Zone for the first time ever, which is, I thought, a really interesting and important thing to see is that they've never known anything outside of the Fright Zone or the Horde. Yeah, and I think it's it's pretty telling that, like, seconds outside the Fright Zone, Adora ends up having this life-changing experience and realizing that she's been on the bad side this entire time. Yeah, I agree, and it's definitely telling of her character that even though she's sort of been indoctrinated with this sort of propaganda that princesses are are evil and that the horde is doing the right thing as soon as she sees the real world she comes to a decision for herself even though she's been raised to think one thing her whole life yeah and when she's in the forest she notices a sword and she ends up going back for it which is how she runs to glimmer and bow for the first time but she has a vision of uh what is that character's name because we don't i don't believe we get her name until like a few episodes later the uh, like the spirit who grants her the power of shira oh that's uh light hope light hope who's a character from the original show they changed a little bit for the new one yeah so she gets the vision of light hope and it sort of hints at the past of etheria and the future of shira and i think it even hints a little bit at adora's past because one thing we see when she finally gets the sword and transforms into shira is you see this sort of dark portal and you can hear a baby crying which i think is hinting at how adora ended up being kidnapped by the horde i know we we, we hear that she was adopted by them but in the original show hordak kidnapped her so i think that's sort of of laying the groundwork for that story later. Yeah, I definitely believe she was kidnapped. Um, whether or not they're gonna keep the origin of like, oh, she was He-Man's twin sister who was kidnapped. Right. Uh, she yet to be seen because like, there was no mention of He-Man or Skeletor who are both, you know, pretty integral to both the character of Adora and uh, Hordak. So I, I'm curious if they're gonna bring that up later or, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I'm curious as well. It definitely seems like they've done some things to lay groundwork to do it if they want to. And there's there's even some stuff later in the season when Adora learns a little bit more about the past of Etheria. But they did name drop Eternia, which is where He-Man and Prince Adam are from. Then there's something later when you kind of find out what happened to Etheria that is kind of a deep cut reference to some old He-Man stuff. So it seems like they've sort of built some in-universe barriers that if they wanted, 
to do a He-Man later, they probably could. I don't know the state of the rights to He-Man and whether or not DreamWorks is allowed to do everything that, or if this team's allowed to do everything with He-Man or not. So I guess it kind of remains to be seen, but I do think it would be cool if they set it up and did a parallel spin-off series, but uh, I don't think the show needs to be connected to He-Man. I think it's great and stands on its own. I'm just thinking, I feel as if they, if they did bring in He-Man, it probably to, uh, it would serve as like further divide Adora and Catra since they are kind of raised as like, uh, like siblings, like in the same household or the same um, organization in this case. But, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I never thought about that. That's a really good point, especially if they are twins and how this, that new relationship with her new brother could, could further divide that relationship with Catra. That's good stuff. Good, good thought there. <laughs> I'm trying like so part one yeah part one ended with the Shiro transformation for the first time yeah and which i thought was two, really cool yeah the transformation sequence is really well done and i'm glad they didn't overuse it every episode like i was afraid they were going to <laughs> yeah it felt because, very anime yeah like i'm used to uh voltron using like the voltron power up sequence every single episode and it takes up like a minute of screen time yeah um, i know i keep thinking back to like when i was a kid watching the first few seasons of digimon and every digivolution would take up like three minutes <laughs> that was just just a way to eat up time. Bo and Glimmer uh, find Adora and they actually manage to capture her since she was off guard and she, Adora basically spits out her horrid propaganda and Glimmer reveals that like, uh, no, like you guys are the bad guys. We're we're just trying to gain peace. That's why we're a resistance. Yeah, that was a, I think that was a really good moment and I liked seeing, I liked seeing Adora sort of slowly come to the realization that what she had been told growing up maybe wasn't true and I think they did a really good job sort of like easing into it and you using what she was seeing rather than what she was being told as sort of the catalyst for her change of heart. Yeah, and it goes to show just like just how sheltered the Horde is and like how they really can't socialize outside of like their own, aside from obviously like Adora and Catra, but that's because they're both kind of prodigies in their own way. I also loved when they finally got to the village of, of Thamar, which was the kind of the first ever society that Adora has seen outside of the Fright Zone. And I, I really loved just seeing her genuine reactions to everything, like the way she reacted when she just ate their food for the first time. I liked that uh, they revealed that she didn't know what a party was. It really, really shows off how sheltered the Fright Zone is and how little she understands about the world around her. She's really just raised in a singular type of place. That's actually a really good point about party. It just because like, again, the Horde clearly isn't like that great at socializing. Later on the season, I believe, like a few episodes after this, Glimmer asks like, do you not know what an on is? And she doesn't know. So she doesn't understand the concept of family either, which I think is like kind of a huge thing that like, the Horde doesn't even like they don't view themselves as families they're like comrades <laughs> yeah true and i think really the only family even though she didn't necessarily see it as family catra was her family growing up like that was definitely her closest and strongest relationship and even if she didn't consciously understand catra as being her family that was definitely the nature of their relationship yeah and while this is all happening we also have a uh, shadow weaver kind of like interrogating catra on where adora is and it ends up not necessarily being a test but shadow weaver's already tracking her through magic. She was kind of just giving Catra a hard time just to give her a hard time. Yeah, definitely. And it seems like that is, that's kind of the nature of her relationship. She she doesn't seem to trust or respect Catra, which definitely leads to Catra's sort of desire to overtake her later in the season. And we also get our first Easter egg of Swift Wind when they're in the village and she uh, makes contact with them and she has like her little moment. It was a good foreshadow, but it was also just like a good moment of Adora bonding with nature and truly like loving it like she's so entranced by everything that surrounds her and wowed by it yeah her genuine reaction to seeing a horse for the first time was such a fun and funny moment i mean and, and it's hard to think about what you might think when you saw see a horse for the first time because we've just grown up knowing what a horse is but being that old and seeing a horse would be kind of mind-blowing like what is that <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> yeah i'm surprised she didn't have like more culture shock than she did just because she discovers so many new things in like a few hours. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think maybe too much culture shock would have distracted from the plot, but I, it does feel like going from the Fright Zone to that sort of small village with all these different types of people would be a little bit more shocking than it was. And just seeing all these different colors for the first time. Yeah, definitely. The Fright Zone is such a such a specific color palette and everything is so much more vibrant in the Whispering Woods. Something that I noticed in these episodes and uh, later on, but the Fright Zone, its main colors are red and green and I feel like that's pretty much reflective of Catra, Shadow Weaver, 
uh, like, you know, green with envy, and then, like, red, just, like, like their anger. Like, it's a toxic place, and yeah. the, the color palette really, like, tells that. Yeah, I agree. And then the Whispering Woods is sort of this vibrant, bright, colorful, life-filled place. I think that one of my favorite things about the show it, are these color palettes, and especially the backgrounds, uh, especially in the Whispering Woods and Bright Moon. They're just really well drawn and really vibrant, and I love the, the detail in those backgrounds. They use the color palettes to their advantage because when the Horde attacks the village, it goes from like really colorful to like uh, muted, just like the negative zone. Yeah, and, exactly. And it's almost like Adora's like soon to be past following her already. The whole part where the, the Horde finally attacks Thamar and Adora comes to the sort of realization that they are a little more evil also has one of my favorite moments in the whole show when uh, when Bo says, it's been an honor to fight alongside you, horsey. <laughs> that was just a good <laughs> Bo moment. That was good stuff. <laughs> Bo's really good. He He's really charismatic. I think his voice editor does a great job of portraying just like his emotions like who this character is i i haven't seen the original she-ra but like this bow just seems like more appealing than the 80s one yeah i don't want to hate on the original show because i know so many people love it but i i found that every character was more dynamic and interesting and likable in the new show so while the horse attacking adora and catcher have their first run-in since obviously adora has defected from the um horde as it was kind of alluded to earlier catcher is like pretty much a miss like she was aware that uh manipulation is Shadow Weaver's thing. Like, she should have says, like, obviously they were, like, manipulating us. And I think she caught on to it as opposed to the other members of the Horde because Adora was the favorite from Shadow Weaver. So Katra kind of just, like, caught on through time, like, how differently she was treated from everyone else. And being an outcast kind of, like, allowed her to observe, like, the, their true nature. But she didn't really have a choice but to, like, stay. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. I didn't think about that. She, she already was treated unfairly within the Horde, so she kind of was able to look at it a little bit differently and see it more for what it was than Adora, who was sort of just fostered uh, more positively by the Horde and embraced by Shadow Weaver. That's a good point. I like that. Yeah, and Adora says she's not coming back. The real beginning of, like, the rift finally manifesting because the seeds were kind of already there from their upbringing, like, unbeknownst to both of them, but it just felt as if as soon as Adora leaves, Shadow Weaver's kind of freaking out, and that's already, like, kind of irritating Catra, but, like, once Adora says, like, I'm not coming back, that kind of, like, instantly, not broke her, her, but it definitely took a toll on her just because what does Catra have aside from Adora? Yeah, and I think it was probably the that moment that catalyzed her decision to sort of start rising up in the Horde rather than, you know, I think before she was, she had a, this great friendship with Adora and that was what mattered to her and she wanted to rise up in the ranks with Adora and just be her friend. But now that Adora's gone, her goal is to sort of overtake Shadow Weaver within the Horde and rise up those, those ranks. I mean, just like, just alone like in this episode you can see Catra's inner turmoil and like how she's torn between like do I want to uh, like try to get Adora back or do I want to move on about her and that's consistent throughout the entire season yeah definitely like when right when they meet again in Thamar and she sort of just comes out of the tank and tackles Adora happily she's just so excited to see her and it's an interesting moment because obviously the horde is like destroying this village and Adora's like look what's happening around you and Catra is sort of like yeah we're the horde like I I've been able to see this the whole time how you have how have you not known this <laughs> and uh, and that was uh that was a pretty interesting moment especially when they when they finally broke it off i really liked that final shot of katra after adora turns into she-ra and sort of takes out the army and you get that shot of katra through the smoke just sort of looking heartbroken and walking off and as she turns away she like her expression changes from like disappointment to anger yeah definitely but for adora she ends up befriending bow and glimmer and i think that was also part of the reason why Katra was so heartbroken in that final shot just because she saw Adora with, you know, her new friends. And yeah. she felt like kind of already replaced. Yeah, and it and it did feel like that because even when Adora's heart seemed to be breaking a little bit right when Katra was sort of looking at her through the smoke, just a moment later, Bo and Glimmer tackled her and like praised her for, for saving the village. And so she immediately has this sort of relief from that heartbreak with her new friends where Katra just doesn't. It just makes you like, ah, Katra's just a really good character. <laughs> I agree. She's great. <laughs> just in these first few episodes, I found her, like, even more interesting than Adora, just because, you know, she has, like, this constant back and forth, with her, like, with both herself and with Adora and Shadow Weaver, whereas Adora is a lot more straightforward with her goal, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just, it, I feel like Catra makes their dynamic a lot more interesting than Adora does. Yeah, I agree. And it also feels like Adora's journey was almost...
almost partially dictated for her because of the sort of protection calling to her. Like she became She-Ra and that kind of led to her discovery and journey, but Catra kind of has to find everything on her own and she has a little bit more of a nuanced and dynamic background with how Shadow Reaver treated her growing up and with her friendship with Adora. And so it is a little bit more interesting because she kind of has to come to these decisions herself. Moving on to episode three, this is the episode where Horsey finally becomes- Swift Wind. I, yeah, Swift Wind. <laughs> I, I keep wanting to say Skywind. <laughs> um. Skywind Sword. I love the part where he becomes Swift Wind and he freaks out. <laughs> that was such a fun decision because like, why wouldn't an animal freak out about transforming into something else? That was just smart. <laughs> yeah, and like uh, finally being able to like speak a different language. Yeah, I think they re they don't reveal that until later in the show though. Um, oh. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that's all good. I mean, I'm sure people have seen it, but but it was that was an interesting that was an interesting thing because I was watching through some of the original show and the Swiftwind is in the first few episodes of the show, but they don't reveal Swiftwind can talk until later, and it's not even a reveal. He just starts talking. So I think it was I think making it this like jarring reveal was sort of an homage to the original. <laughs> yeah, I feel like maybe the original was like an executive decision then. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it might have been. Um, there was definitely a lot more talking and animals in the 80s shows. <laughs> yeah. I really liked the introduction of Madame Raz in this episode. She was a, she's yeah, a really she, she's a character. really fun character. She's similar to a character we meet later in Trapped. I feel like she's kind of like a nutty professor type role. Yes, um, totally. She's sort of an eccentric old lady with a, with a mysterious past that we only get hints of. And I definitely think she'll play a bigger role down the road, uh, like in future seasons. I agree. Um, she, she was also a character in the original show. She was kind of annoying in the original show. But the one of the weird things about the original show is that Adora kept a secret from most of the rebellion that she was She-Ra. So there was only a few characters in the original show who knew that secret, and one of them was Madame Raz. Oh, wow. So yeah, here they don't really waste any time. Because actually at the end of this episode, she reveals to pretty much everyone that she's uh, She-Ra. Yeah, exactly. Which I think was smart because like if these are her best friends, like why would she keep that information from them? It, it made more sense in the 80s to have this sort of alter ego secret, like secret she Shira personality, but it makes a little bit more sense in a relationship-based show that you're not keeping that secret from them. And it also makes Adora just like a lot more of a mature character, especially for her age, like making that decision to be open that like, I used to be part of the Horde, but now I'm like, I'm, I'm standing with you guys and I will take up the mantle of she is a lot more compelling just because you wouldn't really expect that from a character her age. You would expect her to keep up a secret identity and like afraid of the backlash, especially since like this is her first time venturing out to the outside world. Yeah, and it seemed like that was sort of the decision she had to come to in this episode because she, she was already kind of feeling the judgment of people in Bright Moon when she was trying to figure out her transformation. They, As soon as they saw a Horde soldier, they were just like, oh my gosh, a Horde soldier, like, what do we do? So she already knows how she's seen to these people. They did a good job explaining why she came to the determination that like, I need to kind of denounce the Horde and I need to embrace this role of She-Ra. One of the other interesting things I think they did with Matt Adam Raz that was sort of a cool homage to the original show is they had her kind of have these funny lines where one she's like oh I'm not alone out here I have my trusty broomstick and in the original show her broomstick had a face and could talk which was very silly and I'm glad that they didn't do that in this show but that was kind of just a fun callback to that and then she also says uh and also my friend Lou Key but he's always hiding which in the original show there was this character named Lou Key who would hide in shots of the show show and then at the end of every episode he would be like did you see me here I was and then would kind of give a ham-fisted lesson for the viewers at home <laughs> like this episode was about bullying <laughs> here's why you shouldn't be a bully <laughs> that's um, very 80s <laughs> it's it's the most 80s thing the show did I haven't noticed yet but I've heard that you can actually see Lou Key in the background of this show they just don't draw attention to it so apparently hidden throughout the the show Lou Key is just hiding in the backgrounds I was gonna say I feel like he would be in this one too just because that's a really good Easter egg for like just both like old and new fans, especially people who haven't seen the original, but they pick up like, hey, who's this guy that's always in the background? But that makes me wonder if they will like properly introduce him maybe in like season two and make like his little like Easter egg cameos like actually like relevant to the story. Like I was there the entire time or something. Yeah, I'm curious about that too. There are a few characters that they sort of left 
left out from the original show. And I feel like maybe they'll start to slowly introduce them in new ways. And I think that would be cool if they sort of made Luki's background vibes part of the plot. That would be interesting. I believe towards the end of this episode, uh, after Adora rev uh, reveals herself, we see what Catra and Shadow Weaver are up to. And Shadow Weaver is just pretty much scolding Catra for not retrieving Adora. And we also give like our first in-person appearance of Hordak, although this time he's covered in the shadows. I'm not really sure why, because we see him later, like his full design. Well, I guess you, you do see his full design at the end of this episode. Yeah, just but... for a moment you see it. They're kind of keeping him in the shadows. I think it was almost maybe more for Catra's sake. I know, I don't know how well they actually know Hordak or if they've ever met him, because you could tell that Catra was just kind of terrified during that whole situation. So maybe it was sort of, uh, sort of more for her sake than for the viewer's sake. Yeah, and that um, scene actually where Catra becomes Force Captain was shown at a New York Comic Con just like by itself, so we didn't really have much context to it. They showed it after they showed Adora and Catra's like first encounter, and I think already like the fact that as soon as Adora leaves, we see like the immediate consequences and how Catra is beginning to be rewarded and like just kind of like take up Adora's mantle. It continues to like divide them further apart because as soon as Adora leaves, Catra begins to like reap the benefits of everything. Yeah, totally. Even despite Shadow Weaver's objection, I liked that she sort of brought Catra to be scolded by Hordak, and Hordak was like, we're promoting you to Force Captain, congrats. It came right after the scene where Adora pledged herself to the Rebellion, and this was another really cool parallel scene, because you actually see two shots that kind of reflect each other perfectly, of Adora kneeling down to Queen Angela, and then you have Catra sort of, sort of forcefully kneeling down uh, to Hordak, um, and so I, I like the way that they sort of parallel and mirror each other, especially because I think it's definitely telling that Adora was able to willfully go and pledge herself to the Rebellion while Catra was there against her will. She, like, didn't want to face Hordak. And even though she's being rewarded, she was forced to kneel to Hordak. So I think that's a good juxtaposition between the Rebellion and the Horde. Yeah, like, this show just, it, it excels at the parallels and, like, how the characters who are parallels to each other, when one advances, the other also advances, but in, like, different ways. Yeah, I think they did a really good job, especially with Adora and Catra and just their, their simultaneous journeys. So, final thoughts. These first three episodes were just very... It was, it was a good start. Like I said, it definitely took me by surprise just because... I wasn't expecting Shadow Weaver to become an interesting character so soon, just because she had a very generic start. Also, just with Catra and Adora, they wasted like no time establishing like these two are like the real focus of the show, and they pretty much resemble other rivalries you can see in media. Like it gives me uh, vibes of Naruto and Sasuke, or Goku and Vegeta, or yeah. um, Rei Sora and Riku. Ren. Yeah, but it's also like it brings its own spin to everything. Like it's refreshing while being reminiscent of what's coming before it, which I'm not sure if anyone on the crew, any of the writers or uh, the showrunner Noel Stevenson, I'm not sure if any of them are familiar with those properties and they drew influence from that, but they did a really good job. It also reminds me of uh, Azula and Zuko from Avatar. Yes, totally. I definitely think that there's parallels to be drawn with Catra and Zuko because obviously in the early days of Avatar The Last Airbender, Zuko is an antagonist, but they also pit him against worse antagonists. You know, we're cheering for Zuko against Admiral Zhao and against uh, Zula, even though he's still the antagonist to Aang. So I think they kind of do a similar thing with Catra. Like, we're, we're kind of cheering for her over Shadow Weaver, even though she's the antagonist to Adora. It's really good. I can't wait to see more of it. Like, the rest of the season obviously built upon their relationship, but by the time we're done with the season, like, you just want to go to the next episode. <laughs> I know. I It's it's such a bummer that we gotta wait. I, I'm, I imagine that there's gonna be a second season, and I know you guys were at New York Comic Con, and it seems like they revealed some info there that wasn't fully established in this season, so I feel like maybe there's gonna be a second season that they're already working on, but that might just be speculation. Voice actress for Glimmer let out the bag that uh, the character Bo, in this iteration, Bo has two dads, but we didn't see his parents the season. So for the voice actors to know that means they've already recorded something, which means they probably already are working on season two. Yeah, and that wouldn't surprise me because I, I heard that they had planned multiple seasons, and I think that DreamWorks, with the success of Voltron, is really wanting to see this similar 
success with with She-Ra, so I wouldn't be surprised if they were already working on it. Yeah, so hopefully we won't have to wait that long. I'm imagining if like everything is looking good, then we'll probably get a season two like in the spring, maybe even before then, because I think we'll, even with Ultron, it debuted with 13 episodes, but in reality, the first season was actually 26 episodes, but they split them up the two seasons. Oh. So that might be the same case with She-Ra, where it's actually a 26 episode first season, but they're splitting it up at seasons one and two. That would not surprise me. That seems like what they, yeah, that's definitely what they're doing with Voltron because they release like two seasons a year with Voltron, don't they? Because Voltron's ending this year, but um, because they actually began split episodes even more. So the, technically they released four seasons. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's um, crazy. For this year. Yeah, one in uh, the spring and then one in the beginning of the summer, one at the end of summer, and then the final one in December. Yeah, I was going to say, I felt like that show just started and they're already on season eight. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it started in uh, 2016 and started wrapping up. So I feel like if She-Ra is, um, or if Voltron's any indication, because that's also DreamWorks and that's also a reboot of a very, uh, a show made to sell toys, then um, then I definitely think She-Ra probably has a finite amount of episodes too. I'm assuming they already have like an end goal in mind, like this is how the show ends. Yeah, I hope so. It seems like there definitely was a lot of setup this season for future seasons, so I wouldn't be surprised if they've kind of got a full series sort of outline ready to go. All right, that takes us to the end of the video, so thank you again for coming on, John, and where can people find you to see more of you? Well, you can check out my show on Nerdist. It's called Animation Investigation. I'm not the host, but I do write and produce it. I got a great host named Hector Navarro. You can also check out my YouTube channel, Johnny Two Cellos, where I do a lot of reviews and deep dives. I talk a lot about adult animation, but I also also talk about uh, She-Ra and Steven Universe and Avatar and the Legend of Korra. Uh, so feel free to check me out there. I've got a full full season breakdown of She-Ra if you want to hear me talk more about that. All right. And you can find me at Oshrick Vox on Twitter. And of course, more videos here on the Roundtable. Thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed it, please like, share, subscribe. And I've been Oshrick Vox. I'm Johnny Tuchelos. And we're signing out. See ya. Later.